Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Aquarium of the Pacific's Winter Kids Club. My name is Luke, joining you from our virtual studio today. And I'm also joined, as usual today, by two of my fellow educators. You've seen them earlier today if you've watched any of our other programs. Jen is operating all the camera and video stuff this time. She'll be bringing up the different images for us to see. And if you have questions, we also have someone to take those via text. That'll be Stacy, who you just saw in our last program. Now, if you have any questions at all during this program or observations you'd like to share, ideas, answers to some of my questions, feel free to text them into us. That is, of course, with your teacher or parent's permission, if needed, at 562-286-1838. Again, that's 562-286-1838. And if you're watching this program after the fact, if it's not live anymore, you can still ask us questions or send us interesting information you might have discovered because of the things we talked about by emailing us at live at lbaop.org. And we check that pretty much every, we actually we do check it every day, so we'll be uh, happy to respond to anything that comes to that as well. Now, as you've probably heard, our subject today is maybe the most important concept in all of the biological sciences when it comes down to figuring out the ecology of our environment. That is how different organisms interact with and, and engage with each other. And of course, there's a lot of argument over what the most important concept is, but when you talk about ecosystems and environments and habitats, you can't talk about them at all without starting to talk about the food webs that work inside of them. The food webs, that is, is the term we like to use here at the aquarium. Now, Sometimes when we say food web, people get a little confused because you might have heard an older term called, sometimes we used to call it more a food chain. And a food chain is a, you know, the concept is that we, it's maybe kind of easier to understand that, you know, energy starts at the sun, right? That's the source of energy for almost all the life on earth. And then, you know, plants turn that energy into usable material that then something can come and eat. And then something comes and eats that and something comes and eats that, and so on, and it goes on up the chain until you get to the top predators of an environment. So it all starts with things like plants and algaes and even bacteria and stuff, and then it moves on up from there. And sometimes we've called this a food chain. But it's more useful when we're talking about individual animals and more specific habitats and environments to stop thinking of it so much as a food chain as it is to think of it as a food web. Because... It's not as simple as, you know, this animal eats that, then the next animal up eats that, the next animal up eats that, and so on. It's much more complex, because oftentimes it's this animal eats this one, and then this animal maybe eats that one too, except for sometimes when this other animal here is smaller, in which case the animal that, that, it, that ate it maybe doesn't eat it, or maybe will eat it still, or maybe when the predator is smaller, it gets eaten by the other animal. Or maybe, and this is true in most cases, with predatory animals, and certainly with a lot of animals in the ocean, almost all of the fish and, and predators, in fact, there's not just one thing an animal eats, right? They eat and get eaten by a lot of different stuff, depending on the part of their life they're in, depending on where they live, depending on the predators that are around. So it's a really, really complex set of relationships that make ocean habitats, like the kelp forest right behind me, work. And in order to talk about those relationships, in order to start to understand how they work, we really have to begin by observing the behavior of the animals we encounter. If we want to learn what the food web is in an environment, right, we've got to observe that environment and start to see what we can figure out. Now, if you look at this habitat behind me, where would you think that the food web starts? What's the very bottom thing on the food web or food chain in an environment like this? I mentioned a minute ago that right the, the the first resource that the earth that almost all the life on earth gets its energy from really to begin with is the sun right so but the thing is most things on earth can't get energy from the sun i can't get energy from the sun it can warm me up but i can't eat it right but what organisms in this habitat do you think can use sunlight to make energy for themselves and to grow would that be a potential bottom of the food chain it's one of them it certainly can be one of them right there's some kelp in this habitat right behind me. This is an example of a producing organism. But you'll notice that the animals we see in this exhibit aren't eating the kelp. That's for one thing because the kelp is artificial in this exhibit, but also because a lot of the basic resources in the ocean aren't in the form of big things like kelp, but a lot of the sunlight actually gets processed into usable food by phytoplankton, by tiny, tiny organisms that float around closer to the surface. 
So when you talk about an ocean food web, usually the very, very first thing you're talking about is this. This stuff here, these phytoplankton, are tiny little floating plant-like organisms, really algaes, that are actually able to get energy from sunlight and grow. And in turn, the ocean food chain develops from there. So let's say you're looking at those tiny little organisms, the phytoplankton. What kind of animals can you think of that eat phytoplankton or that eat any kind of plankton? Is there an animal you can think of in the ocean that eats tiny, tiny organisms? Hard to think of, right? Well, you know why? Because oftentimes the phytoplankton aren't even eaten by animals that you can see. Oftentimes they're eaten by slightly larger plankton. And it's only when we get up to those that you start to find animals eating animals that you can actually see doing the eating. Believe it or not, these teensy tiny little organisms that are so small you need a microscope, microscope to see them are consumed by slightly larger teensy tiny organisms you also need a microscope to see. And for example, an organism like this. And in turn, this is where it gets even crazier. Tiny organisms like this one and other small, teeny, tiny animal plankton. And this guy in real life is, is big, tiny, very, very small. It's called a copepod. Have you ever seen SpongeBob? This is the villain from SpongeBob. It's got one eye. It's, it's right there. <laughs> and um, these tiny little organisms are in turn eaten by, some, by slightly larger plankton and sometimes eaten by fish and so on. And then it goes up from there. So it's really, really, really complicated. On land, it's a lot easier to talk about the food chain and food webs, right? Because usually the beginning of the food web on land is plants, right? There's things like sheep and cows and deer and stuff that eat grasses and eat, eat different kinds of, and eat plants of various kinds, right? Eat, you know, leaves off of bushes and trees, that kind of thing. And then they in turn have predators like wolves and lions and tigers and all that sort of stuff, right? But in the ocean, it's really, really weird because most of the very bottom of the food web starts with these teeny little organisms that are so small you can't even see. Bigger, bigger plant-like organisms like kelp are eaten by some things like sea urchins, but they're not the main source of that, those basic nutrients that all the other animals are depending on. But once you get past the plankton to animals you actually can see, that's when it starts to get really interesting because there's plenty of fish out there that do eat plankton, that are able to catch plankton with their gills, some fish are even able to eat them one at a time. I'm thinking of something with a very, very small snout. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if Jen can think of what I'm thinking of. Aha, creatures like this. See this thing? This is a sea dragon, close relative of another animal you may have heard of, the seahorse. And those long, thin snouts that they have at the end of their heads, those are used for catching individual plankton. They just float very, very carefully around and they see a little plankton and they, they have a, they, when they eat, it's called snicking. They basically snap out their mouth at it to grab it and they catch individual plankton. And here's a seahorse that does the same thing with that tiny little mouth. Now, there's other animals that can do this in larger amounts. There's actually even bigger animals that can eat plankton. Things like lots of different kinds of fish can catch plankton with their gills. And in fact, one of the largest fish, in fact, the largest fish in the ocean, the whale shark, and another big shark like the basking shark, here's a whale shark here, are able to live off of plankton. This is a basking shark here. It gives us a good idea how this works. See all how the water is kind of murky around this shark? That's because there's plenty of plankton in it. This shark just swims around all day long with his mouth wide open, not waiting for some fish to fly in, but waiting for all the tiny little stuff, the little plankton floating in the water, to get caught inside its gills, which it not only uses to breathe, but also uses to, also uses to catch food. And every once in a while, the basking shark just boom, closes its mouth and sucks all that plankton out of its gills, and down it goes. So that's why we call it a food web, right? Because it's not like, oh, the tiny animal is eaten by a slightly bigger animal, and then a slightly bigger animal, and then a slightly bigger animal. But it's more like the tiny animals are eaten by some tiny animals, and then some kind of mid-sized animals eat them. And then there's some really enormous animals that eat them. Another great example of an animal that lives almost all, almost totally off of plankton is most of the baleen whales, things like the blue whale and so on. But in between, there's all this other stuff going on. And that's where, mo and speaking of which, here's another animal that eats plankton, jellyfish. So they're kind of a mid-sized creature, right? And what eats a jellyfish? 
Well, things like sea turtles, for example, eat jellyfish, right? So I know this is getting super confusing, and that's why it's so interesting. Because, again, we're talking about food webs. So if you start with any organism in the ocean, and any organism in general, right, you can draw a whole bunch of lines of relationships, relationships to and from it, depending on what it eats, what it maybe gets eaten by, and so on. Sea turtles are a predator of jellies. But in turn, they also sometimes get attacked by other organisms. Sometimes they get eaten by sharks. They're pretty good at avoiding that, but it does sometimes happen. And even when we get up to the biggest predators in the ocean, we oftentimes find that they, in certain situations, can have predators too. What's the most famous shark you can think of off the top of your head? Any ideas? Famous shark. Hmm. I don't know. Famous, famous shark. Well, there's Seymour Shark. If you guys like the Pacific Palace, you might have met him. But, ooh, how about this one? The great white shark, right? Great white sharks, we think of as these amazing predators. They're at the very top of the food chain, right? Well, most of the time, yeah. But again, remember, it's not that simple. It's more like a food web. Sometimes even big predators like them have predators too. Great white sharks are actually eaten sometimes by orcas. Crazy, huh? So that's how elaborate and complicated it is. There's so many different relationships. Every animal you think you understand that it's the top of the food chain or not, and it might have maybe a little, some predator of some kind that preys upon it. It might have different things that can prey upon it at different parts of its lifespan. So there's lots of organisms that, right, when they're really little, when they're first born or first hatched, they maybe have predators that they don't have to worry about when they get older, and so on. But this is all just making it sound more and more complex. If we want to start to figure out how these food chains work and how these food webs work and where an animal might fit in a food web in the ocean, the best thing to do is to really start looking at the animal and making observations about it and trying to see if those observations you're making about it, about how it looks, how it moves, what kind of body parts it has, can you start to tell you where it might fit into this massive web of all these different relationships of animals that eat different things. So if we look at a shark, right, that's not so hard to do. We can look at a shark and go, okay, well, great white shark's got big, sharp teeth. So... Do you think a great white shark would need big, sharp teeth to go chase around some, I don't know, some plankton? Would you taste, chase around a teeny, tiny little animal with big, giant, sharp teeth? No, probably not, right? You'd look, for, <laughs> you'd look for bigger stuff to eat. But let's say you have a teensy, tiny little mouth like this guy. What would you eat then? Or like, this, or like these fish back here. Their mouths aren't s as small as a seahorse, but they're pretty small. What kinds of things might you eat then? This is, here's a good example. Got a butterfly fish here. And that small mouth there, right? What's that for? Well, you're not going to be eating big things with this tiny mouth. This fish, by the way, is about the size of my hand. Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit smaller or larger, depending on the size of the individual. And if you look at that mouth there, well, this is not going to be chasing down sea lions, right? But and it, it might try to eat some bigger plankton, I guess, but the tiny microscopic ones are going to be real small and hard for it to catch. And it also doesn't have the giant mouth it would need if it wanted to catch a lot of plankton at once. So another thing that we see a lot of in the ocean, among a lot of fish, when you see these tiny, teeny little mouths, is animals that are more interested in scavenging. And scavenging is really interesting because a scavenger can eat just about anything as long as they can fit it in their mouth. But that means, though, that... The stuff that they're eating could have come from another animal's meal. It could be leftover, decaying stuff from something that maybe died before. It could be bits of old, of old algae or old coral. There's all sorts of different things, and this is true of a lot of different kinds of fish. Fish in the ocean oftentimes have specific things they try to aim to do and try to aim to eat. But a lot of them, a lot of them, like our butterfly fish here and also a lot of the other famous fish like unicorn fish and stuff like that and clown fish and surgeon fish are more than willing to scavenge and kind of catch anything that they think they can and there's in the ocean there's a lot of leftover flying around on land you know when a big animal like a let's say a lion or a tiger or something eats right they're pretty thorough they clean off they they eat as much as they can of the things that they catch and then when they're done with that thing it only stays in one spot but if a shark comes along and grabs onto some big thing and eats a bunch of it, 
the ocean is kind of a messy eating place. So all these pieces go all over the place. And a lot of little smaller fish will come in and try to grab those leftovers. And also, in order to make sure they're getting all the resources of food they can, these different kinds of animals will have different, again, body shapes, mouth shapes and stuff that allow them to maybe access foods and leftovers and, and algaes and stuff like that in places that are harder to get into. And sometimes allow them to prey on things that other animals can't get to. Like, for example, if we look at the fish in this video here, swimming around, is there any fish here that would be good at getting its mouth into very tiny little holes, maybe deep little holes? I saw one a minute ago. Let's see here. Let's see. If you wanted, if you wanted to get into one of these tiny nooks and crannies, even that was smaller than, your, than the rest of your body, you'd either have to be a small enough fish to get in, right? Or you'd have to have some kind of special mouth that allows you to get in there. And if we watch, there was one at the beginning of the video anyway, you can actually see some, forage, some, some, some foraging going on right there. Let's see at the beginning again. I'm going to see him come by. Here we go. Come on, help me out, fish. I saw you. There, look at this. Fish. Look at that long, pointy mouth. That is, even though that fish is one of the bigger fish that you're seeing in here, that thin, long mouth, there it is again. Here's another example here on another butterfly fish. Allows that fish to get its mouth into tiny little spots that maybe other animals can't get into. So it can access food that other animals can't reach. So this is another thing to think about. When you're looking at animals in the ocean, another big thing to consider, and if you're trying to figure out where they fit into the food web, is one, what do they look like they could eat? And two, what do, do you think could probably eat them? Now, if you look at this fish, this fish is probably also maybe a little smaller than my hand, maybe about, I don't know, about, about that big or so. This fish is small enough, right, that if I were a larger fish, something like a barracuda or a, or a grouper or a giant sea bass or something like that, and I saw a fish this size, I'd be like, great, if I can get that, I'm going to eat it. And that's exactly what those bigger things do. They're mainly looking for food. They're mainly looking for kinds of things they can catch that'll fit in their mouths, they can digest. And they, sometimes they're not even as smart about it as they could be, for example. Sometimes you'll see big fish, just because they're looking for fish of a certain size, they'll sometimes try to eat things they really shouldn't. Like there's a great video somewhere on YouTube of a, of a grouper trying to swallow a puffer fish that's decided to puff up inside of its mouth. And eventually the grouper has to give up because it can't swallow the puffer fish. <laughs> so animals in the ocean really, really do look for a lot of different opportunities to find food. They're always trying to find different resources and stuff they can exploit to eat. Even this little guy, right? He might spend most of his day looking around the coral reef, maybe looking, for, looking in little cracks and crevices and stuff for little leftover bits of food or stuff, that, or maybe little teeny animals like teeny crabs and shrimp and stuff to eat. But then he also, if he happens to see a shark pass by that's just bitten into something and has left its crumbs flying all over the place, might be like, you know what, I'm gonna, now that the shark's gone, I'm going to fly out there real quick and grab, or swim out there real quick and grab some of those little pieces. So fish are really, really opportunistic. They like to look for the food opportunities that are around and take them. And that's even if they tend to have something more specific they do on a regular basis, they will still exploit a lot of other food resources if they can get them. But so far I've just talked about fish. What about the other kinds of organisms that live in the ocean? I did mention whales briefly earlier, but what about some of the even weirder creatures that live in the ocean? Things like lobsters and crabs and... and uh, I don't know, octopuses and stuff like that. Well, they fit into the food web too. When you look at crabs, a lot of them actually do the same thing that, that a lot of fish do, which is scavenge. There's a lot of scavenging in the crab world, like this one right here, for example. Look what this crab's doing. See all that stuff around his, mo his mouth, all those mandibles and stuff? Believe it or not, the general scientific term for that, those things are mouth parts. That's actually what we call them. Each part has a name, but when you talk about them all at once, you say mouth parts. Now, that crab, let's watch that video again. I love this video. He's such a busy guy. He's like, I got good camouflage. I got algae growing all over me. And now I'm just going to wander around the ocean floor, maybe waving my little mouth bandable parts around, catching any plankton or anything that might be in the water around my mouth. Those things are all designed to move to towards mouth. And then when I find something good and big like this, I think it's a, a snail. I'm going to pick it up and see if I can turn it over and crack it open and get the pieces on the inside or something to suck the uh, soft parts out. That's what I do. This crab scavenges around, 
occasionally might prey on something that's actually alive. Like maybe if this snail is alive, maybe this crab has got the ability to get in that shell and try to get part of the snail out. But this is what a lot of the crabs do. And there are also, of course, some animals in that part, at that level that are predatory too. Some animals that are, some invertebrates that are predatory. Although crabs, there are some predatory crabs and some even predatory things like shrimp-like organisms and stuff. Mostly they spend a lot of time scavenging. There are other kinds of invertebrates that might surprise you that are actually predators too. For example, you know what, I'm just gonna let Jen bring one up and see what happens. For example, ooh, one of my favorites, the cuttlefish. This, the, it's called the cuttlefish. It's a different kind of cuddle though. It's not like cuddling, even though they do look kind of cuddly. They also look very like sleepy and thoughtful. I always felt that cuttlefish look like they're contemplating something really important. You know, like, hmm. Now this cuttlefish here is actually predatory. It hangs around next to rocks and corals and stuff like that and waits for an ideal moment when something that it thinks it can catch, sometimes like a small crab, sometimes even like a small fish comes by. And then it lances out its tentacles and grabs it and pulls it in. And just like an octopus or a squid, the cuttlefish has a beak that it can then use to pull open something. Here's an example of this. Here's a little shrimp. Boom! Got eaten by a cuttlefish. You can see the camouflage behavior of the cuttlefish too having in there. times if it's convenient, if it's possible. Most, some animals in the ocean have a hard time eating anything that they have to catch, right? But there, there, there's, if the situation is right, most ocean animals will take the opportunity to eat, to eat things, to eat other animals, even if they normally eat algae or stuff like that, because animals are so much more nutritious. Now, the cuttlefish is a great example, but I have to say that when you look at the cuttlefish, right, you think, well, it moves around, it's got these tentacle things, like I guess I can understand about a it being a predator. What's another invertebrate that would surprise people if, to find out it was a predator? I'm thinking a very slow moving one. What other invertebrate on the ocean bottom is a predator that might be kind of surprising? Hmm, I wonder. <laughs> I, clearly I have to, uh, okay. This, this isn't what I was thinking of, but now you're all wondering, what is this, right? So, this is what's called a hooded nudibranch. Um, in more simple terms, you can think of them as floating slugs with an umbrella head that they use to catch plankton. Look at this thing. Look at it go. So, this is the body back here. This thing... This thing either holds on to a wall, which is actually it is holding onto a wall, I think, here, but they can also they'll sometimes also float depending on the variety. The wall is black, so you can't see, but it's it's holding on. And those all those all little dots floating around, <laughs> those are all different plankton. And this is actually in one of our aquariums here at the aquarium, but these are these things actually showing you how they eat. So this is the again the hooded nudibranch, a type of again, like a sea slug with an umbrella for a head that it uses to just wave around and catch things. I guess you could also think of it as a kind of net, even though it doesn't have like a mesh, but oh, I guess it's a little meshy here. But this, this hood, just they just go and they fold it in and they whatever they caught, they eat, and then they just and they do it again. That's what they do all day long, as long as they're hungry. And they're pretty much always hungry, furthermore, because the more they eat, the faster they can grow, the more they can reproduce. So that's another surprising predator. That thing is a predatory animal. Wild, huh? Now, here's the one I kept on thinking of. You guys can probably tell what this is on the bottom. Folks out there, what do you think this is? It's a sea star, right? So, and this is, if you didn't know it was a sea star, that's okay, because usually you see sea stars from the top, right? This is the bottom part with all the weird tube feet they use to suck onto stuff. And in the middle, they got a mouth. You know that sea stars are predators? It's true. Sea stars, so far as I know, almost never eat algae or plants or anything like that unless it's like tangled up with their normal food. What they do is they go along the ocean floor and even though they very rarely move, very rarely move when humans are looking at them at like a tide pool or something, they actually can move, they just move kind of slowly. 
and they move along slowly, and they find things like clams and stuff. And then they wrap their, and then when they find those things that are slow enough for them to catch, they wrap their body around it, pull open the shell with their sticky arms, and then they spit their stomach out into it to eat it. Another kind of surprising predator is hanging out with these sea stars here. And that's something that a lot of people mistake for some kind of weird sea flower or plant. In fact, they're actually named after flowers. They're named after a flower called an anemone. But most people today probably know the word anemone from this thing. Believe it or not, they're actually named after a little flower. But anyway, <laughs> these things here, even though they never really move from their rock, or almost never move from their rock, they're predators too. They're waiting for something to float by and get caught on all of their stinging, sticky tentacles. An anemone is basically a jellyfish that lives on a rock permanently. And sometimes they'll even catch fish and stuff like that. So fish have to be very careful around anemones. So the moral of my whole story here, when you talk about the ocean food web, is it is complicated. It's much more complex and much more interesting than it is when we talk about some of the more simple food webs that we're more familiar with in our everyday lives or on land, right? Like I said at the beginning, on land, there's plants that do most of the productive work that we animals depend on, right? They produce, they produce food mass that we can either eat directly or that can be eaten by some other animal, an herbivore, and then a carnivorous or omnivorous animal can come along and try to eat that herbivore, and that's how energy goes up through the whole system, right? And sure, in land animals, there's sometimes opportunistic stuff where an animal maybe is able to catch or eat something that it doesn't normally eat because of maybe it was extra hungry so it decided to try extra hard or maybe because it was in a weird situation or that animal was somehow the other animal was disadvantaged somehow but in the ocean it's so much more complicated scientists are all the time catching new evidence of really surprising things trying to eat or successfully eating other stuff in the ocean one of the great things about today, right, is that we have waterproof underwater cameras that are pretty cheap and pretty easy for scuba divers to carry around and stuff. And constantly we're finding new reports of some animal doing something that's really surprising and really bizarre and eating something you never would have expected. Because it turns out that simple relationship that we thought we, under we used to think we understood pretty well of the food chains and how different animals are at different points in the food chain and then one thing gets eaten by another, that gets eaten by another and so on, is actually much more complex. Sometimes the food, the food chain leads up. Sometimes, though, it'll actually, there'll be an animal that's up somewhere high on the food chain that actually gets eaten by something you think is lower, or maybe by an animal that you think is on the, another part of that food chain. And so it starts to look like a food web. And when we look at the animals in the ocean, each individual animal you see, even if they have something that they tend to specialize towards, something they tend to focus on eating, oftentimes will have a lot of other optional foods that they'll take advantage of whenever they can get them. You think sharks are the most amazing things in the ocean, right? Well, guess what? Sharks get eaten by dolphins sometimes. They get eaten by orcas, of course, which is the biggest dolphin. They, they sometimes get eaten by eels. I saw one almost get eaten by a big grouper one time. You think dolphins are the most amazing animals in the ocean? They have predators too. Sometimes they're eaten by sharks that also prey on them. <laughs> so... It's really, really amazing. It's complicated. And again, it's really about learning to understand how energy and how, re how food resources move around inside an ecosystem, inside a habitat. Now, I hope everyone has enjoyed learning about this today. I've certainly had a fun time talking about it and exploring our different habitats and talking about some pretty weird predators and some pretty weird prey. And if you want to learn more about this, remember, you can always check our webcams and we have a, wor a worksheet a activity sheet, I should say, that you can check out on the aquarium's website on the same page that this video was originally linked from. And of course, if you had a great time, we'd love for you to share your adventures online with the hashtag AOP Kids Club. And we will be joining you again in just a little while with our final Winter Kids Club, I think, of the, of the year, right? Our last one of the year. And so come back and check that out. But don't worry. We're not going anywhere. We're going to keep on going back to, we're, keep on going to, we're going to keep on doing videos like this. But since schools are starting up again, we're going to go back to calling them the Online Academy. And uh, you'll see us again next week if you want to come visit. And we'll be doing pretty much the same stuff. So thanks, everybody, for joining us. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you again, hopefully, in about a half an hour. Bye-bye, everybody.